if you are just joining us, we're right in the middle of a, a three-part series on the New Testament book of Titus. Uh, Titus was one of Paul's, the Apostle Paul's, uh, protégés and partners in sharing the gospel. They traveled together uh, all over the expansive Roman world, just sharing the gospel and planting churches and that sort of thing. And in time, Titus became uh, Paul's like go-to guy, his chief troubleshooter. Uh, he traveled as Paul's representative to churches that were spiritually struggling with sin or secular influences and help them to restore their virtue and vitality. And one such mission took Titus to the island of Crete, uh, a mountainous island southwest of Greece in the Mediterranean Sea that was believed by many to be the birthplace of Zeus. And Titus was a, he was a competent and capable missionary, but Cretan culture posed many problems. You know, like the, the rest of Rome, Crete was plagued with pagan cults. Um, Crete's Mount Ida was considered sacred by Zeus worshipers. Uh, slavery and sexual immorality, including promiscuity and prostitution and even pedophilia, were commonplace in Greco-Roman culture. And even, even among their con contemporaries, Cretans were you know, considered lazy and untrustworthy and immoral. Titus clearly had his work cut out for him, encouraging and empowering believers to live their lives according to God's morals and values was countercultural, and it still is today. You know, as I said last week, you, you don't have to but, you know, turn on the news or, or surf the internet for a little while to see that we live in an increasingly non-Christian, and in some cases even anti-Christian culture. And as Bible-believing Christians, many of our views on you know, theology and moral issues are just increasingly maligned and mocked and marginalized by secular society. You know, modern social norms, distorted morality, opposing worldviews often place Christians at odds with our surrounding culture. And so the question is, how do we live Christ-like lives in a secular society? How does the church counter culture in a positive and productive way? Well, thankfully, Scripture provides us with at least some answers to those questions. Shortly after leaving Titus on the island of Crete, the Apostle Paul sent him a brief letter outlining his mission and his responsibilities while he was there on the island. Uh, he begins by emphasizing the importance of godly leadership. Uh, he actually says in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, he says, I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete the work there and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. And we looked uh, at this first chapter last Sunday where Paul goes on to describe the, the certain qualities and characteristics, things to look for in potential leaders in the church. And he highlights specifically their relationships, their reputation, and their resolve their commitment to the faith. Paul knew that the only way Christianity could thrive in a sinful society was with good, godly leadership. But as Paul continues into the next chapter, he identifies several more, three more, essential elements in effectively countering culture. Uh, if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, go ahead and open it up to Titus chapter 2. Uh, Titus 2, in this chapter, Paul, uh, like I said, he identifies three more essential elements, beginning with our need for truth. We need truth. Um, Paul begins this chapter saying in verse 1, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And that phrase, sound doctrine, means accurate or true teaching. Uh, a little later in the chapter, he says again in verse 8, teach the truth so that your teaching can't be criticized. If we have any hope of countering a corrupt culture, it is absolutely essential that we teach truth. Now, Titus had to combat a variety of religions and worldviews that perpetuated fictions and falsehoods. You know, not only was Crete known for you know, worshiping the gods and goddesses of Greco-Roman mythology, 
uh, many islanders also belong to the Egyptian cults. You know, they worshipped Egyptian gods like Isis. Um, emperor worship was also prevalent. You know, there were cults dedicated to Augustus Caesar and, and Claudius Caesar. There was also a, a significant Jewish population on the island who adamantly opposed Christianity. And Paul tells Titus in verse 14, he says, they, that is the, the people of Crete, must stop listening to Jewish myths and the commands of people who have turned away from the truth. Paul knew that the only way Titus could combat or overcome these false and fraudulent belief systems was by declaring and defending the truth. And the same is still true for us today. You know, like Titus, we live in a, a culture with a variety of competing worldviews, religions, and belief systems that are simply untrue. But even worse, truth itself is countercultural these days. You know, the, the very notion of truth is under attack. And I'm not just talking about, you know, fake news or misinformation on social media, but rather we live in a culture where people are encouraged to determine their own truth. You know, regardless of reality. But listen, truth is real, and truth matters. Truth isn't merely a, a matter of preference or opinion. It doesn't yield to the size and strength of the latest lobby group. Rather, truth is true, even if everyone denies it. And a lie is a lie, even if everyone affirms it. You know, there's this, this old anecdote about Abraham Lincoln, who was once having a conversation with someone that was kind of antagonistic toward him. And Lincoln asked him, he said, well, let's see, how many legs does a cow have? And the guy answered, well, four, obviously. And then he said, well, let's say the tail is also a leg. How many legs would a cow have? And the guy says, well, five, of course. And Abraham Lincoln says, now that's where you're wrong. It still has four legs legs. Just because you call a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. And Abraham Lincoln was exactly right. Truth, reality is not determined by our preferences and our opinions. Just because you call an unborn child tissue doesn't make it disposable. Just because a 52-year-old man identifies as a six-year-old girl doesn't make it true. There are a lot of different realms of truth. You know, mathematic truths, moral truths, scientific truths, spiritual truths. But in the words of Augustine, all truth is God's truth. And the most important truths are found in Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus testified before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, saying in John chapter 18, verse 37, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And similarly, he told his disciples in John chapter 8, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If we want to know truth, if we want to be set free from a life of sin and self-deception and subjectivism, then we need to listen to Jesus and be faithful to his teachings. And ultimately, Jesus himself is the personification of truth. He, he boldly claimed in John 14, verse 6, I am the truth. Not I tell the truth, but I am the truth. If we hope to counter the deceptive and dubious claims of our surrounding culture, then like Titus, we need to confidently declare and defend truth. We counter culture by teaching truth. And furthermore, in addition to truth, countering culture also requires teachers. We need teachers. Now, I know this might sound a little maybe too obvious, but we can't teach the truth without teachers. They kind of go hand in hand. And as Paul uh, continues, he says in verses 2 and 3, teach the older men to exercise self-control. Be worthy of respect and live wisely. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. Over and over, in fact, throughout this chapter, Paul goes on and he tells Titus, teach this, teach that. I need you to teach the people of Crete. But Titus wasn't the only one expected to teach. 
teaching and training disciples is too big a job for just one person. And so Paul adds in verse 4 and 5, right after he tells Titus to teach the, the older women, he then says, and these older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, to be submissive to their husbands. This, this chapter is replete with this idea of mentoring relationships. That's what Paul's describing here. He expected the, the older, more mature Christians to mentor the younger, newer believers. In fact, that's what he himself did. You know, he calls uh, Titus back in chapter 1, verse 14, my true son. And he says the exact same thing about Timothy over in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. These were the two young men that, that Paul really poured himself into and mentored them in their faith, helped them to mature and grow in their faith. Jesus did the same thing. He chose 12 disciples to mentor and teach. And these disciples lived with Jesus for three years. They traveled with him from town to town. They watched him performing breathtaking miracles and, and just absorbed his life-changing teaching. They, the more that they listened to Jesus, the more like him they became. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, their training ended and they continued Christ's ministry and mission and trained other people to do the same. This type of spiritual mentoring and training is absolutely essential for countering culture. You know, young people today, millennials and centennials, are under constant pressure to conform to societal standards, you know, to embrace political ideologies, moral values, and philosophical views that conflict with Christianity. And most of them, as they go off to college and enter the world on their own, are completely unprepared to defend their faith. And so we've wound up in, in recent years with record numbers of 20-somethings leaving the church and abandoning their faith. And the only way to counter this mass exodus is by equipping young people with the truth. But truth, especially moral and spiritual truth, is best taught in the context of relationship. I mean, you're familiar with the old saying, I'm sure, that you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. In order to truly teach and train young believers, we need to walk along next to them, encourage them, and, and pour into their lives, as well as give them good reasons to, to defend their faith and the ability to answer the questions they might have. You know, research confirms that, that quality mentoring relationships have powerful positive effects on young people in a variety uh, of personal, academic, and professional situations. And so I want to encourage all of our older Christians, and older is relative, obviously, even if you don't think you have all the answers, even if you, you feel like you still have some learning and growing of your own to do, it doesn't matter. Start mentoring someone. You know, look for younger believers that you can encourage and equip and come along next to and, and offer advice to. The truth cannot be taught without tr teachers. And it's too big a job for, for one person. We all have to work together to do that. The next generation of Christians depends on you. And finally, in addition to truth and teachers, we need transformation. It's not enough to know the truth or even to tell other people the truth and teach them if it doesn't also transform the way that we live. Paul actually begins his letter by touching on all three of these topics. He says in 1 Titus 1.1, I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. See, it's not just about teaching and truth, it's also about this transformation, living a godly life. And in the same vein, everything that, that Paul t commands Titus to teach is about how they live. You know, he said, you know, teach the older men to, to live in a way that's worthy of respect and, and to, you know, be self-controlled and patient, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and teach the old, younger women this and the older. It's all about how they live. And, uh, and in order to living... In other words, I'm sorry, learning the truth isn't simply about knowing more. 
It's about living differently. It's about allowing the truth of Jesus Christ to transform our lives. In the second half of, of chapter 2 here, Paul writes, um, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave His life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us His very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. You must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. See, when we receive Jesus as our Savior and the leader of our lives, a change should take place. You know, our lives should be transformed to reflect the hope that we have in Christ. Jesus frees us from, like Paul says, godless living and sinful pleasures and calls us instead to live, not outside the world, but to live in the world, in the culture that we're in, with wisdom and righteousness and devotion to God. And, you know, honestly, I, I couldn't think of a better contemporary example of this than Kanye West. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the headlines this week, but this chart-topping hip-hop artist known for his explicit lyrics and narcissistic persona and flamboyant marriage to Kim Kardashian made headlines with the release of his latest album titled Jesus is King, which released at number one last week, by the way. And at a listening party for the album, West announced, I want to let you know that I'm not here to, to entertain you this afternoon. We're here to spread the gospel. I'm a recent convert, and that means I got saved within this last year. Um, he claims to have been radically saved, and he's been speaking publicly and frequently in interviews about his newfound faith in Jesus Christ. And in response, both Christians and non-Christians have just been up in arms over whether or not Kanye's conversion is real or whether or not it's going to stick. And I don't know the answers to those questions. I don't know why anybody would even ask those questions. I suppose for the same reasons that Christians doubted Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. But all I can say is when you compare the lyrics of his previous albums to the lyrics of Jesus is King... It's obvious that Kanye has experienced a radical transformation. Of course, the, the headline of Kanye's conversion story, or any conversion story, isn't the convert, it's the converter. Not Kanye, but Christ. At the end of the day, I believe that Christ can transform Kanye West for the same reason I believe he can transform me. And it's that transformation when we go from godless living and sinful pleasures to living with wisdom and righteousness and devotion, verse 12, when, when we're filled with love and patience, as Paul says in verse 2, when, when we're totally committed to doing good deeds, verse 14, that's what arrests people. That's what, what causes the world to sit up and take notice. That's how we counter culture. Genuine transformation comes from the grace of God when we place our hearts and lives in the hands of Jesus. And to quote one of Kanye's new songs, you won't ever be the same when you call on Jesus' name. Living a life of biblical faith in a secular society isn't easy. It goes against the grain. It's countercultural. And in order to counterculture, we need truth. The truth of Jesus Christ. We need teachers mature Christians willing to encourage and equip the next generation, and we need transformation. Lives that have been radically changed by the truth and teachings of Jesus. Next week we'll dig a little deeper. We'll go into Titus chapter 3 and see what else Paul offers us for following Christ in an unchristian culture. But in the meantime, if you need some help in your Christian walk. I don't know, maybe you're, you're struggling to accept or to understand the truth and you could use you know, a mentor or a teacher to come along next to you and encourage you. Or, or maybe you've been resistant to change, but you're ready to let Christ transform your life. Then I want to invite you to come and talk with me. Uh, you can pull me aside after church or you can call me at home or you can just come forward now while we stand and sing together. Let's sing, church.